Welcome back. So today we're going to be looking at phrase structure rules. So we're going to take what we learned from constituency and what makes a constituent and actually look at the pieces that make up the main constituents that we have in English. So when we're looking at phrase structure rules, what these offer us are the rules that we actually use to put things together. So in English, we have very rigid rules of what constituents can have, what they can do. We have a very limited amount of morphology. So in English, we use syntax instead to convey meaning, to convey relationships between pieces in a sentence. In other languages, sometimes word order can be a lot more flexible. So um, the example for morphology of Latvian case markers, that ending that's on each of those nouns allows those nouns to move to different places in the sentence, and you still know what the role is in that sentence because of those markers. We don't really have any of that in English, so instead we use these rules in, um, to tell us what we can do, what sort of constraints we have on what makes a sentence make sense in English. And so we call these phrase structure rules. And so if we're looking at just active voice sentences in English, the word order in most phrases can't really change. We always have to have about the same order for everything. So a noun phrase will always have a determiner, and that will always become, come before our adjectives, and that will always come before our noun. And that's something that doesn't change. We can't move those around within a noun phrase and still have it make sense as a sentence or as a phrase in English. The one exception, and we'll see some examples of this when we get to verb phrases, is that adverbs can move around in a sentence. They don't have to stay in their same spot. They don't have to stay in the verb phrase. We can move those around, but most of our word classes don't have that freedom and don't have that ability. So when we're actually diagramming what these look like, what a phrase or a clause word looks like, the order of the words when we're drawing them out needs to be in the same order as what we see in the diagram. It shows us the way we're actually putting things together, the way that we're ordering things. And so the order when we're drawing them out should look the same as what the original sentence looks like. So the order in the diagram is very important in that way. So when we think about what goes inside particular constituents, in any constituent, there's going to be some things that are required, and then there may be some things that are optional. So when we're looking through what these actually look like as we're going through each of them, if you don't see any sort of marking, it means it's required. If you find something in parentheses, this means it's optional. And if you find something with an asterisk, this means that theoretically you can have an infinite number of them. You can put more than one of them into that constituent, in that placement in the constituent. So for example, a noun phrase in English has to have a noun. There's no marking on that noun. There has to be a noun no matter what. It's what the phrase is named after. And then you can have a determiner, and notice there's no asterisk, you can only have one. You can have adjectives, theoretically as many as you want. You can have prepositional phrases, theoretically as many as you want. And you can have S, which would be a clause, so we can have dependent clauses in our noun phrases as well. And the determiners, the adjectives, the prepositional phrases, our dependent clauses, are things that are all optional. And we can have multiple adjectives, we can have multiple prepositional phrases, but no matter what, there needs to be a noun in order for it to be a noun phrase. So if we look at that again when we're talking about noun phrases, we can look at some examples of different kinds of noun phrases. So children is a perfectly fine noun phrase. It has a noun, nothing else. I can say, I hate children, and that works perfectly fine as a sentence. I don't have to add anything to it but I can add things to it if I want. So I can say the scrawny cat in the attic and add a determiner, an adjective, a prepositional phrase, or I can have a very elaborate noun phrase such as the four big yellow balloons with polka dots in the sky which floated away. And so in this case, balloons is our noun, it's the required part, but I can also add a lot more information. I can add a determiner, I can add several adjectives, I can add multiple prepositional phrases, I can add a dependent clause at the end and that's all still part of that one noun phrase. So you'll notice that there can only be one determiner in a noun phrase, even though we can have multiple adjectives. So when we were going through word classes, you notice that numerals sort of had that uniqueness where they can kind of fit into a determiner kind of place, but they also fit into the adjective slot in a noun uh, phrase. So if I say the my black cat, this doesn't work because I have two determiners, but I can put a numeral with a determiner so I can say the three black cats. So even though numerals are in some ways a kind of determiner that goes with nouns, they function more as adjectives in our English sentences because they don't fit the same requirements that other determiners would have. 
So if we draw out what a noun phrase would actually look like if we're making different trees to sort of visualize what these look like, you'll notice that there can be a lot of variety in a noun phrase. So I can have a noun phrase that only has a noun in it. And so if I just say aardvarks, aardvarks eat ants, then I have a sentence that only has one single noun in that noun phrase. But we still need the noun phrase level before the noun level. And this is important because of the way that we structure everything. So even though there's only a noun in there, theoretically we could have other pieces in that noun phrase. So we still need to break out those two different levels. I can add other things and have something like the fat orange cat. So I can have a noun phrase with a determiner, two different adjectives, and a noun that's in there. Or I can have a noun phrase that has a determiner, and that can also have a prepositional phrase. And this is where that embedding comes in, into play and becomes very important. So in a noun phrase, I can have a determiner, I can have my noun, and then I have a prepositional phrase. And since that's another phrase that ha has its own structures, I then have to break out the different structures as well so to a preposition, and then the noun phrase hats in this case. And for space, I didn't put the extra noun, but there would be, if you were fully drawing this out, another noun underneath that noun phrase level. And so now that we can see there are prepositional phrases, we'll look at that structure as well. So prepositional phrases will always have a preposition head and will always have a noun phrase dependent. There are no optional elements in a prepositional phrase. In English, we always have preposition and noun phrase, no matter what. So I can have a simple one, such as towards Phoenix, where the preposition towards has a noun phrase that consists of just a single noun. Or I can have a much more complex noun phrase that has its own structures as well. So in the haunted house that burned down last week, I have that noun phrase, the haunted house that burned down last week, that I would then need to break out the structures for into multiple level levels as well. And prepositional phrases are things that you can embed either into a noun phrase or into a verb phrase based on the kind of information it's giving you. So if I have a noun phrase or a verb phrase, I can say Alex hit it with a hammer. And with a hammer is telling me something about how the hitting took place. So it would go with the verb phrase. It would attach to the verb phrase in that case. But if I say Pat ate the cake with frosting, with frosting isn't how the eating took place. It doesn't have anything to do with the verb. It's only telling me something about the noun. The cake has frosting on it. So this would, in this case, it would attach to the noun phrase. And so when we think about embedding, we have to think about what information it's connecting to, what it's telling us about, to determine where we actually attach that in the structures. So to look at trees of those two sentences, you can see the difference in how we structure them, where if Alex hit it with a hammer, that prepositional phrase that has its own embedding, its own structure, would go into the verb phrase that has hit in it. So we have our noun phrase Alex, our verb phrase with our verb hit, our noun phrase that has our pronoun it, and then we have our prepositional phrase that's attaching directly to the verb phrase because it's telling me about the verb. So with a hammer tells me about how the hitting took place, so that prepositional phrase attaches directly to that verb phrase. And then we have a prepositional phrase that can be inside a noun phrase. And so in our example here, Pat ate the cake with frosting. With frosting isn't telling us about the verb. So rather than attach it up to the verb phrase, we bring that down and attach it inside the noun phrase because it's telling us just something about cake, about that noun itself. So it's embedded within the noun phrase because of the information that it's telling us. So we have our determiner, our noun, and then the prepositional phrase that's in there. And so that gives us the kind of information that we need for that. If we move on to verb phrases, verb phrases contain a verb, and then it can also include other pieces as well. So we can have prepositional phrases, noun phrases, auxiliary verbs, adverbs, negation markers. We're not going to focus on negation in this class because it gets a little bit more complicated than the rules that we're going to look at. So we'll look at rules that don't have negation in them because of the variability that exists with that. And then this just gives you a variety of examples of the kinds of verb phrases you can have. Now, when we talked about verbs in word classes, we talked about different kinds of verbs. And so depending on the kind of verb you have will depend on the kind of rules that you're looking at. So with a verb phrase, there's three different forms depending on the kind of verb you have, whether it's an intransitive verb, a transitive verb, or a ditransitive verb. 
And the base structure of all of these is the same. It's just there's some additional required pieces if you have different kinds of transitivity. So for an intransitive verb phrase, you have to have a verb head, and then you can have other dependent elements as well. So our verb phrase requires a verb, and then we can have an auxiliary verb in front of it. We can have adverbs, and we can add multiple of them. And remember, adverbs are the ones that can move around in different places. They don't have to be after the verb. They can be in different places. And then we can also have multiple prepositional phrases in an intransitive construction. So if I say slept, as in I slept, that's a perfectly fine sentence. I don't have to add anything, and I can't add any other required elements to that because sleep can't have any sort of objects. But I can also add all of these other optional elements and say I am running quickly at the park with my dog at dawn, in which I'm adding my auxiliary form, I'm adding an adverb, I'm adding multiple prepositional phrases. So we can have a lot of different structures, even with an intransitive phrase, that only requires a noun. And then again, remember that adverbs can be in different places in the order of a verb phrase. So while they're listed after the verb, they can be anywhere in the verb phrase. And really, we can move them outside of the verb phrase as well, though we'll try not to look at examples that sort of confuse too much outside of what's in these different phrases. For transitive verbs, you do have additional things that are required. So the same optional elements are there, the same verb is there. But a transitive verb also requires a noun phrase as an object. So if I say, I read a book, I have a noun phrase as well as a verb phrase because that is one of those transitive examples. And then all of those other optional pieces can also be there as well. So if I say, we are baking pies quickly in the kitchen at the restaurant, I have my auxiliary R, my verb for baking, I have that noun object that's required, and then I have additional optional elements that can also be there as well. And then for ditransitive verbs, we actually have two different possible constructions in English. And we don't have a lot of different verbs that are ditransitive, but this is where we have two different objects. So you can either have a noun phrase and a prepositional phrase that are both required in addition to the verb head, where I can say, I sold some candy to the kid, and I need both of those pieces of information. If I say I sold some candy, I need to know who got the candy. I sold to the kid, well, what did I sell? So both of those pieces are required. And then I can also add additional elements as well. Or in some cases, we can get rid of that prepositional phrase and we can move it in front of the other noun phrase um, and just get rid of the preposition entirely and have what's called a double object construction where we have a verb and two noun phrases. So we have sold the kid some candy instead. So rather than having it in a prepositional phrase after the other noun phrase, it gets moved in front of that noun phrase and drops the preposition. Or I gave Mary the book yesterday at the park. I could also say I gave the book to Mary yesterday at the park. So I can use either of them in most cases and it'll still help us um, see the different kinds of requirements for a ditransitive construction. And then if we look at a tree, an example of this, if I say I donated a book to the library, we have our noun phrase that has our pronoun just I, and then in the verb phrase, I have my verb, and then I have my noun phrase and prepositional phrase that are both required to be there. So I can say a book as my noun phrase and then to the library as that prepositional phrase. And this is one where you probably wouldn't be able to switch it into that double object construction. I donated the library a book, doesn't really have the same kind of sound that makes it make sense. Um, so not all cases of ditransitive ones will allow that double object, although you do see that sometimes. And then the last main constituent that we're going to talk about is the clause. So clauses are, tar are the largest of our constituents. These are marked or labeled with a capital S, so you can sort of think sentence for that. And they can be either independent clauses or dependent clauses. Independent clauses are what we think of as a complete sentence. So there will always be a noun phrase and a verb phrase. You never have anything besides that as the construction for an independent clause. So your noun phrase is the subject of your sentence. The verb phrase is everything else. You will never see another branch off of that S. It will always have just those two pieces. Anything else will be inside the noun phrase or inside the verb phrase, no matter what. And then we have dependent clauses. 
And dependent clauses kind of look like a sentence, but they can't stand by themselves because they're embedded inside the structure. And the ones that we'll look at are just the ones that go inside noun phrases, which would contain a relativizer and a verb phrase rather than a full noun phrase and a verb phrase. So in the independent clause, the guy who ate apples went to the farmer's market yesterday. I have my noun phrase, that's the, the subject, and then everything else goes in that verb phrase. But within that noun phrase, you'll notice who ate apples, which also has a verb in it. But this is still part of that noun phrase. It's part of the subject. So this would be a dependent clause that would have who as the relativizer, where who links up to that guy. So you can kind of think of an arrow connecting those two of them, where the relativizer is sort of equal to whatever that noun in the main noun phrase is. And then you have a verb phrase, in this case, ate apples, which would have a verb, and then a noun phrase with just a noun inside of it. So when we're going through these different rules, you'll notice that most of the time these are very strict. So all of the ones that we have in English are listed here that we'll talk about in class Our independent clause, which will always have an S that goes to a noun phrase and a verb phrase. Our dependent clauses that can be found inside a noun phrase that instead of a full noun phrase, we'll just have a relativizer instead. Our noun phrases that can have determiner, can have adjectives, have to have a noun, can have prepositional phrases and a dependent clause. Our prepositional phrases, which will always have a preposition and a noun phrase and nothing else. Our intransitive verb phrases that require the verb and then have our optional elements. And then our other verb phrases that still have the same basic construction as an intransitive verb, but then have required elements of, e of the objects that are part of that. So what this allows us to do with these different structures is to draw full trees based on what we've seen. And these are different abstract representations of the structures of our phrases or sentences. This gives us a way to sort of look at how our brain is organizing what is happening in a sentence. And so we'll be spending the next couple of classes together in our Zoom classes, practicing drawing these trees, thinking about how these work together. And the way that this, what this shows us is that the constituents end up being grouped together under a single node or a branch of the tree, it gives us a visualization of those different constituents where they're going to all have the same branching off under the node of that phrase. And then those larger units can also have smaller units embedded inside of them. So you can have a noun phrase that has a prepositional phrase, which will have to have a noun phrase. That noun phrase might also have a prepositional phrase, which has to have a noun phrase, and so on and so on. So you have that different embeddedness and you have those different levels that you see. And a note that's really helpful when you're starting to draw these out, when you're thinking about them, is to think about what the word classes are for each of the words first, and then sort of see how they relate to each other before you draw your tree. So if you see a determiner, you know you have to have a noun phrase because they can only go inside a noun phrase. If you see an auxiliary, you know it has to be inside a verb phrase. It's the only place it can go. So it can help you as you're trying to link things together and determine what those constituents are before you draw everything out into a tree. And then the last part that we'll talk about uh, as far as syntax trees, as far as these different kinds of constituents grouped together, is what happens when we have ambiguity. So ambiguity happens when you can have more than one interpretation, more than one kind of tree, or what we would call a parse. So one example, time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana, is a phrase that you may have heard. And when you're looking at these, you see the same words, flies and like, but they do something different in each of them. So you would have a different interpretation. You'd have a different tree as a result of that. So if I say time flies like an arrow, in the first half, flies is a verb, and then like is a preposition. So based on what they're doing, what their function is, they have a different word class associated than they would in the second clause, where flies is a, a noun, and then like is the verb. So we can have the same words that do different things. They look the same, but they function differently. And then that gives us different trees as a result. So if we look at those two different trees, we have time flies like an arrow, where we have our sentence with our noun phrase time and our verb phrase. And that has our verb flies, the prepositional phrase with our preposition like, and then the noun phrase that has to go inside of it. And then that breaks up into our determiner and our noun. But if I have fruit flies like a banana, I have my sentence with my noun phrase fruit flies. And so I can break that out if I had the space for that. And then the verb phrase has the verb like, 
and then just a noun phrase, a banana, that's inside of that as an object. So we can see examples of this, and there's times where the exact same sentence can also have multiple interpretations. So I'll show a short clip um, that gives an example, and then we'll talk about that clip. So when we're looking at this example, it's kind of humorous because when you think about who you hit a guy with glasses, in this case, it has two meanings and they're playing off of both of those meanings. They're playing off of that ambiguity. So the question is, is the guy wearing glasses or did you hit him using the glasses as a weapon? And you get a different interpretation based on what meaning is, is taking place. So you either hit a guy with glasses, using those glasses to hit the guy, or you hit a guy with glasses. <clears throat> and so what's happening is that prepositional phrase is attaching to a different place depending on the meaning that it has. So if we look at the trees for these and look at the sentence, you hit a guy with glasses, we end up with two different trees. And so the way that you would separate this is by saying in tree one, with glasses is going with the verb because it's telling me what he hit him with. So you hit a guy with glasses and because the glasses are the weapon, they're telling us about the hitting, so that prepositional phrase attaches to the verb phrase. But if the guy is wearing glasses, it's not telling me about anything except for the guy. So you hit a guy with glasses, where the guy is wearing glasses, that prepositional phrase is instead inside the noun phrase itself, and only get connecting to guy because that's all it's giving us information for. So in our synchronous class, we're going to have a lot of practice. We're going to be able to ask questions, go through all of these, um, and try out different sentences to break them off into these different drawings and think about how we actually structure all of our different constituents. So until then, if you do have questions, don't forget you can email me, you can schedule office hours with me, and you can bring questions to class. Um, we'll address those um, as we're practicing and as we're looking at um, lots more examples of all of these. Aha! You wouldn't hit a guy with glasses, would you? Aha! You hit a guy with glasses. That's, that's well.